Welcome to the inaugural episode of Hack Your Blood Sugar. So this is the podcast dedicated to empowering you with practical tips and strategies for mastering your blood sugar levels. So in agonizing over what to talk about for the first episode, I was really tempted to start with all the alarming statistics about type 2 diabetes and pre-diabetes and all the stuff they're related to. And I even recorded one draft of it, but frankly, it was so darn depressing and boring that I decided to scrap that and just get straight to the good stuff. <laughs> so also I'm guessing that because you're even here listening to this, you already know why it's important to pay attention to your blood sugar. Um, maybe you're someone who's already decided not to buy into the whole idea of living with diabetes and has decided to try to reverse it. You already know that poor metabolic health and prediabetes is that it's an inevitable result of aging. And you know that that's not true. And if you don't understand all of this yet, I really promise to get to this over time, but just not today. You already have an idea of how much control over your health. And I'm just going to try to help reinforce that idea and reinforce that level of confidence that you do have more control over your health than you think. So I want to jump right in today and jump to the punchline and start sharing the advice that I give the most often to my clients every single day. In fact, these top three blood sugar hacks have made a profound difference for countless individuals, not just my clients, but I have talked about them before and blogs on YouTube videos. And I hear from people every week that tell me, you know, I've been following your advice and it works. <laughs> so I love it that people don't even have to speak to me, that they can use these ideas and really improve their blood sugar and improve their health. These hacks are not only simple to implement, but they also yield remarkable results right from the get-go. And they are a perfect example of the 80-20 rule, which is at the foundation of how I practice. Now, if you're not familiar with the 80-20 rule, it's the idea that roughly 20%, sorry, that roughly 80% of your results come from 20% of your efforts. So in business, they observe that roughly 80% of a company's sales might come from just 20% of its customers or in the personal development realm, which is where we are, the 80-20 rule is used to identify the most impactful actions that lead to desired outcomes. So by focusing on these most effective strategies or habits, individuals like you and I can optimize our efforts and achieve better results with less overall work. So when it comes to blood sugar, when it comes to blood sugar, I help my clients identify these actions by using a continuous glucose monitor or CGM for short. And I encourage my clients to use a CGM for just a short period of time, maybe four weeks. And that's how we identify this, you know, this 20%, this, the minimum amount of work to get the result that we want. But because I've been looking at continuous glucose monitor data for hundreds of clients over the years, I feel like I can now confidently share with you what works well for nearly everyone. So while I would encourage you to use a, a CGM at some point, you don't have to use one to benefit from the things that I've learned from seeing all this data. But do keep in mind as I go through these things, there are plenty of other things that may need to be addressed for individuals. And in fact, blood sugar issues are very individual and why there's a whole bunch of people right in the middle that just, you know, just need to improve their diet and just need to do the standard stuff. Um, there's a lot of people that fall outside the norm and for them, they need to take different actions. So do keep that in mind, but without further ado, let's dive into the top three blood sugar hacks. So you can start today because for some of you, this might be all you need. Hack number one, follow the order of eating. This is one of the simplest yet most effective ways to manage your blood sugar levels, and it's to pay attention to the order in which you eat your meals. And it's pretty simple because it doesn't ask you to change what you eat, just the order in which you eat it. So for example, instead of diving straight into your pasta or first thing when you sit down at a restaurant to reach for that bread basket, I'm going to recommend you start your meal with a few bites of high protein food 
or if lacking that, a non-starchy vegetable like a salad. And what this does, and you know, I'm not saying that you have to eat all of your high protein food or all of your salad. You have to eat some of it. And what this does is it helps slow down the absorption of sugars from your other foods you eat during the meal, resulting in more stable blood sugar levels. Let me explain how this works. When you are digesting your food, you might know this. First, it goes down your esophagus and into your stomach and then into your small intestine. Your food is absorbed into your bloodstream primarily when it's in the small intestine. So if you eat a, say, a piece of bread, that piece of bread actually isn't going to spend much time in the stomach. It's going to pass through the stomach relatively quickly, go to the small intestine and get absorbed in short order. And it's going to lead to a blood sugar spike, probably one that's a little too high. However, if you were to switch and eat a high protein food before that bread or whatever, so a high protein food would be like an egg, a handful of nuts, a few bites of fish or chicken, or even some beans, that protein in that food will change things up. The high protein food needs to spend more time in your stomach to be digested. It needs to spend time in that acid and with the enzymes that are in your stomach. So when it hits the stomach, there's hormones that are released that slow gastric emptying. And that means it slows the emptying of your stomach into the small intestine. It creates kind of like a time release effect. So it doesn't just slow that. It slows everything downstream of that. Everything you eat after that protein also gets slowed down. So this effectively slows the absorption of glucose into the bloodstream. And if we're looking at the continuous glucose monitor data, what it does is it flattens the curve. So it goes from being a, you know, a real spiky curve that's very high and tight to more of the, the rolling hill. I think we all know what flattening the curve looks like by now. Now, this has the side benefit of reminding you to eat some protein during this meal. And that is no small thing because I find a lot of my patients don't eat enough protein, especially at their breakfast and lunch. So they get enough protein, which has benefits in many other ways, one of which is it helps reduce your craving for snacks and sweets. So, and that, I mean, I don't have to tell you how much that can help. So first hack, follow the order of eating. Eat some protein first. Hack number two, stop eating two to three hours before bed. Now, I know it's tempting to snack at night, but those late night munchies can wreak havoc on your blood sugar and disrupt your sleep. To prevent this, stop eating two to three hours before bed. Just eat your dinner, eat it in a timely fashion, and stop eating. This gives your time, this gives your body time to digest your last meal and allows your blood sugar levels to stabilize before you hit the hay. Plus, it promotes better sleep, which will in the long run, also improve your blood sugar levels. So I want to say right here that a lot of people struggle with this one, and if that's you, there's a good reason. I see quite a few people who don't eat enough during the most active part of their day, especially protein. And if they don't eat enough during the day, they get legit hungry at night, and they need to sort of make up for this deficit. On top of that, under eating during the active part of your day, yo-yo blood sugar throughout the day and high stress will all kind of contribute to elevated evening cortisol levels. And elevated cortisol levels tend to make you more hungry, you might have noticed. And they, they lead to cravings of what we call hyperpalatable food. And I think you might know what hyperpalatable means. So you're sort of being programmed at a biological level to eat more, to overeat, and overeat foods that might not be as good for you. So if this is you, then you might actually have to first address the causes of late night eating. And that's often what I do with my clients is we identify some of those things, find strategies to make that work. And then we can close that kitchen and it's, and it's easier. And this is one of those examples of the more we learn what our bodies need and learn to give our bodies what they need, the easier these things are going to be rather than fighting our bodies. And this is part of learning how to work with your body instead of against it. And in addition to the 80-20 rule, 
working with your body instead of against it are both really core values to me and how I work and support my patients. So learning how your metabolism works can make this part so much easier. Finally, we have hack number three, take a short walk after dinner and after lunch. Now, let me be very specific. I'm talking about a 10 minute stroll, not a jog, not a hike, not a brisk walk, not a long walk, a stroll, a sniff walk for you dog owners. Seriously, by not just flopping on the couch or sitting down in front of the computer right away after your meal, just for 10 minutes, you can really improve both your digestion and metabolism. And I'm going to admit something to you right now. I have heard this advice. I have I learned this advice in school to tell people like who have diabetes to take a walk after meals. It helps blood sugar. But I'm going to admit to you right now, not only to, I just, I never told anybody that. I never gave anybody that advice. And I never did it myself because I didn't believe that a short stroll would do jack squat. I, I just, I mean, really think about it. A 10 minute stroll? No, you're going to have to do more to make a big difference. So why would I invest my time in it? But then when I finally had an opportunity to use a continuous glucose monitor years ago, and I could see the precipitous drop in my blood sugar after I ate a meal, and I just took my dog out and just walked around for 10 minutes. That, I mean, that was enough to convince me that it was worth my time. And to this day, I, even in the winter time after dinner, I take my dog for one lap of the fields every night, every single night. And the thing about this is I've seen, I've trained a lot of dietitians on how to use continuous glucose monitors with their patients. And they have said the same thing. They come back and say, Karen, I can't believe how much a walk after a meal drops your blood sugar. I'm like, dude, I know, I know. I can't believe it either. Now, like I didn't, I, and I, I think I'm going to recommend that more often because it really works. I mean, seriously, people, this makes me think that one of the reasons continuous glucose monitor use works so well for my patients who have blood sugar issues is because I don't think people actually believed me before when I told them what would work. I mean, they kind of believed me, but I don't think they really believed me. And when they see their data, now they believe me. They don't have to believe me. They can see data. And that's why I like using them. So just like protein, eating protein first, that order of eating has an extra benefit. Going for a walk after a meal has another benefit, and it helps you digest your food. Now, this is another thing that I disproved to myself, or I, I have totally different advice than I, now than I used to. I used to assume that after you have a meal, the best thing to do would be to just lay down, read a book, and rest for half an hour to let your body digest. Don't tax it in some other way. And that's totally wrong. Now, it's true that you're not going to digest your food well if you eat a big meal and then can do a hard workout go for a big bike ride or do some weightlifting. That's not going to help you digest. But doing a stroll definitely will. And I, the other thing I see besides dysregulated blood sugar in my practice a lot is reflux or heartburn. And I'm telling you, the playbook for low-hanging fruit to improve heartburn, reduce amount of reflux that you have, is to go for a walk, get up and go for a walk after a meal and stop eating two to three hours before bedtime. So when I put people through on these programs, especially my group program, some of the first things I hear are, well, I'm sleeping better and hey, my heartburn isn't bothering me <laughs> anymore. So don't you love it? I mean, it, it speaks a lot to when you can do something and it has, has multiple positive benefits in your body. And that's, again, that's, that's the 80, 20 rule. So, um, there's two words of caution, though, that I have about this walking after a meal business. And the first one is sometimes it can cause your blood sugar to drop too low. But let me tell you when this tends to happen. If you take this too far and you decide, well, off a 10 minute stroll helps and I'm going to go for like a three mile power walk after lunch. I want you to know that often when people do things like that, that does lead to hypoglycemia. You'll get dizzy and a little nauseous and cold and clammy. And I won't go into the so much of the why, but basically 
you know, you've, you're putting out a lot of insulin to drop your blood sugar down. And then if you do a lot of hard exercise, that's the equivalent of giving yourself an extra dose of fact, fast acting insulin, and it'll drop your blood sugar too much. So that can be problematic. So a 10 minute stroll is really enough. And the other word of caution is this, and this is, I'm really serious about this. It's very easy to get on that slippery slope and go from, oh, I've watched my blood sugar, my CGM numbers, and I know going for a walk after dinner helps. So I'm just going to go for a 10 minute walk after dinner, call it good and get on with my life. And watch wearing a CGM continuously month after month after month, watching it like a hawk and exercising after your meals until your blood sugar comes down to 90. That is not only unnecessary, it begins to become psychologically unhealthy. It's, it, that's a, it's very dysfunctional. Um, so if you catch yourself doing that, that is when I generally recommend people to stop using a continuous glucose monitor. It's gone beyond, it's, it's benefiting you, and now it's going to the other side and it's starting to become a little too obsessive. And lots of us are prone to this. So go for that 10-minute walk and call it good. If you find that your blood sugar stays very high long after, you know, sometimes it'll pop right back up after your walk. If you find it stays up very high for longer, then the idea isn't that you go for a longer walk. The idea is maybe look and see what you're eating during that meal and modify what you're eating. Okay. You don't need to have fl flat blood sugar in order to have healthy blood sugar. So there you have it, friends. My top three blood sugar hacks. By paying attention to this order of eating, not eating two to three hours before your bedtime, and taking a short walk after your meals, you definitely can better manage your blood sugar levels and improve your health. And finally, I love to hear how these hacks work for you. And I love it when followers either on Facebook, Instagram, or email um, reach out and tell me how something has worked. So don't be afraid to do that. And I think in the next episode, um, the thing to talk about next would probably be to explain a little bit more about these continuous glucose monitors. So um, I think that's what I'll record next. <laughs>